Well, good morning and welcome to Maitland Presbyterian Church for our online worship service. Thank you for being here with us today. Lots of new ministries coming online, things like the new women's group on Thursday nights, the new mental fitness group on Wednesday nights. So make sure you're checking your email and reach out to us if you have any questions about those. Our drive-in prayer service meets again this morning if you're watching this on Sunday, and that's Sundays at 11 a.m. There is some construction around the church, uh, so check your email, but you'll, you may need to come in off of Maitland Avenue this morning instead of off of 1792. So uh, we have that virtual suggestion box and, and you can use that for any suggestion. And one thing that several of you asked for was that this online worship service have more of the traditional flavor. So uh, come back next week because next week the whole service will be traditional. But this week we're gonna do it the way we've been doing. So ready? <laughs> Let's worship God. Hey everyone, good morning. Thanks for checking in this morning. It's been an incredible month around here so far. We've been discovering how creative God is and seeing how he made us to be creative too. And we're talking about creativity as imagining what you could do because you're made in God's image. It's pretty great to know that we're made in God's image because, well, God is great, right? All month long, we've been learning about God's indescribable creativity. We've learned by reading in the book of Genesis that there's no limit to God's creativity. Then we learned in Ephesians that God created us so we can be creative too. And after that, we learned from reading about the story of Queen Esther that God created us for a purpose. And last week, we learned about four really creative friends. And through them, we learned that God created us to work with others. Who remembers our memory verse from the beginning of the month? It's Psalm 145.3, and it says this, Lord, you are great. You are really worthy of praise. No one can completely understand how great you are. And that is so true. It's impossible for us to understand how truly great God is. One way we can clearly see God's greatness is in his creation. He's made some pretty amazing things and we've been looking at them all month long. Take salt, for example. You probably don't think much about this simple ingredient that maybe you put on your eggs or on your popcorn, but salt plays a huge role in the natural world. Have you ever seen the salt flats? That might look like sand, but it's actually salt. Yep, if you got down and licked that ground, it would taste like salt. Well, salt with probably a little bit of dirt. But yes, it would be salty. Salt flats are created when lakes in the desert dry up. How about the Dead Sea? It's salty like the ocean, but a lot saltier. That extreme salt has caused some really amazing salt formations in this area of the world, which actually is near where Jesus lived when he was here on earth. Not only that, but there's also so much salt in this particular sea that it's impossible for people to sink in the water. Crazy, right? Of course, other than all those really cool things that salt can do, it, you know, it just really tastes good, right? What's better than some salty popcorn or some salt and vinegar potato chips? Yum. My favorite. So, for our last week in August, can you guess what we'll be talking about today? If you said it has something to do with salt, you're right. <laughs> today we're going to dive into the book of Matthew and learn that God created us to share his story. Now you may be asking me right now, Miss Vanessa, what in the world does that have to do with salt? Well, you'll have to tune in after the message to hear all about it. I'll see you soon. Thank you. 
Well, today we're going to look at our next spiritual discipline in the study of Richard Foster's Celebration of Disciplines. Uh, this week we are reading about the discipline of service. When we read the title of the chapter, we're like, uh, no problem. <laughs> Maitland Prez is great at service. You need 10 people to sort canned food? We got you. You need some PPE donations for teachers? Don't even worry about it. And don't get me started on how many books we have here at the church right now from the book drive. But let's just say it's a good thing we have a little extra space in the building yeah. because so many books. So does that mean that we just get like a pass this week? Yeah. Not really. <laughs> because there is a specific kind of service that Foster talks about that's different than how we normally think about service. So before we jump in, let's remember the caution that Foster gives us with every spiritual discipline that we study. And that is to not let the means become the end. The spiritual and dis disciplines are intended to help us grow closer to God, but we can get tempted to get so focused on doing the discipline that we forget why we're doing it. So in the end, when we do disciplines with the proper intention, they'll point us to God. With service, that means it not only points us to God, but to others too. This starts with our intention. When we serve so we can be seen doing it and look, you know, super duper righteous, we miss the point. But when we serve to grow closer to God, not only does our faith grow, but the faith of other people grows too. And that's why we share the service that you all do as a church. And we know we promote those things a lot and we share them with everyone who will listen to us. And honestly, it took us a long time to get comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. We didn't want people to think we were just trying to look good or trying to brag about our church, but the church needs to be seen doing good. People need to see the work that you're doing. You know, partly because <clears throat> the church needs to continue to grow and partly because the church in America, at least, has earned a bad reputation that we have a responsibility to try to change. So when we do service as Christians in our community, it helps people see what Jesus is really all about. But the kind of service we'll talk about today is something, uh, it's different. It's harder to do in public, it's harder to document, it's even harder to do together. So it's less of a group project and more of a one-on-one -on -one way that we practice service as a discipline. So we'll be looking in our Bibles in John chapter 13, and we'll read all the way through verse 1, 1 through 15. Okay, ready? Now before the festival of the Passover, 
Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So we've heard this story before. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. We're sent out to wash other people's feet, to serve others the way Christ has served us. And there's something so quiet about foot washing. It's so personal. It's one person doing something for another person, so much so that it's almost invisible. Yeah, it's different than book collections or volunteering at a shelter or handing out food. And all those things are absolutely service and essential to our walk of faith as Christians. But since you all already have that kind of service down pat, let's look at the second kind of service that Richard Foster talks about in celebration of discipline. So service as a spiritual discipline, the way that Foster talks about it in his book, is not about looking for the biggest problem in the whole world and trying to fix it. It's about, about growing closer to God by serving others in hidden ways. Foster shares seven different ways that we can do this. And we'd like to spend the remainder of our time together this morning looking at these disciplines and how we see them in the life of Jesus. So as we look at this list together, take some time to think about which one you might try this week. All right, you ready? All right, let's do it. Seven right, ways. The first one he mentions yeah. is the service <clears throat> of guarding the reputation of others. This one ties into the discipline of silence, but it's a particular kind of silence it's the, the service of not even listening to, let alone participating, in gossip. Remember when the people surrounded the woman accused of adultery? Mm -hmm. You know, what did Jesus do? Instead of listening to the gossip, he asked them to look at their own lives and see if they were perfect. Then he was silent and he drew in the sand. When you guard the reputation of others, you're not just keeping yourself clean, you are washing the feet of the person being talked about by guarding their reputation. The second one is the service of common courtesy. The Apostle Paul wrote to Titus that we are to be gentle and to show every courtesy to everyone. That's in Titus 3 2. Too often we don't value those little acts of common courtesy. You know, we want to get right to the point, mm -hmm. say what we feel, we call it being authentic. But taking the time to engage in courtesy is another way we do this discipline of service. It's a way that we acknowledge others and affirm others, and it takes such a small amount of time to do things, like write thank you notes, which I should be better at, <laughs> write thank you notes, return phone calls. It takes precious time to make small talk with people that you might never talk to again. Just greet them and get to know them a little bit. Common courtesy is a way we serve others, and it's a way we're attentive to God. This one is connected also to the third one that Foster mentions, uh, the service of hospitality. You know, some of Jesus's most famous miracles have to do with service through courtesy and hospitality. He recognized the needs of people. 
I mean, he would stop teaching to share a miraculous meal of bread and fish or change water into wine. Now, this one, this hospitality one's complicated right now in the time of COVID when we shouldn't be having others into our homes and we can't cut the day old donuts into quarters and put each one in a muffin cup at church. Yeah. I miss those. We miss those donuts, guys. But in a way, the kind of hospitality we can show right now might just be the kind that's closest to a spiritual discipline. You know, when we get together in backyards and can't share food and can't show off our clean houses, it gets us back to what hospitality is really meant to be. Spending time with others, listening and sharing, serving others by giving them what they really need, our time and attention. So the next discipline, the way that Foster talks about doing this discipline of service is the service of listening. Not just like, yeah, yeah, but really, really listening to what people are saying to you. Not just waiting for your turn to talk, not just listening in order to give someone the correct answer that you're sure we're looking for, but we serve others by letting them talk, by truly paying attention to what they're saying. Foster says to listen to others quiets and disciplines the mind to listen to God. Jesus, if anyone, didn't need to listen to anyone. He had all the answers. He knew what everyone was thinking. He knew what we'd done and what we're about to do. And yet over and over again in the stories of Jesus, what do we see? Jesus asking people questions. He listened to their stories. The next one uh, is the service of being served. You know, you might remember when Jesus first went to wash Peter's feet, Peter refused. Sometimes it's hard for us to receive the gift of being served. Sometimes our service is a way for us to have some kind of control. But it's very important for us to recognize that we are not in control. We grow closer to God through submission to God. And we can practice that kind of submission by submitting to being served. Well, another one is the service of bearing one another's disciplines. So in Galatians 6, 2, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. As Christians, we are called to weep with those who are weeping. And this has never been more exemplified in Jesus than when he died to take our burden of sin to the cross, to do what we never could have done for ourselves. So we bear one another's burdens because they are there to be shared. And it's an act of service that breaks us out of our own concerns and pushes us to take someone else's burdens as our own and then to lift them up in prayer. Then there's the last one. Number seven. Uh, the service of sharing the word of life with one another. The last way that we wash feet for one another is sharing the encouragement we have in the one who washed our feet first. You know, sometimes in prayer, God might lay something on our heart for us to share with someone else. But we think, ah, that can't be right. I mean, why wouldn't God just say that directly to that person? Well, because God believes in service too. God knows that someone might hear something better from you. And God desires our obedience and cooperation. So it's an act of service to act on those leadings, to act on those promptings. So share those, those words from God with whoever they were meant for. You'll grow closer to God, and so will they. So service looks like building a house, or feeding the hungry, or collecting items for the poor. Service is advocating for the vulnerable and standing up for justice. And service is washing feet washing feet of people by bearing their burdens, by listening to their story, by protecting their reputation, and by really welcoming them into your life in new ways. So this week, try starting each day by, by praying this simple prayer. Say, Lord, as it would please you, bring me someone today whom I can serve. Well, now this is the time in our worship when we give our gifts to God and the work of God's church. We're so grateful to each of you and the way you have been so 
faithful to support the ministries of Maitland Presbyterian Church and its outreach into the community too. So let's listen to the offertory. You can give online at maitlandpres.org slash give. You can mail a check into the church. We have a locked mailbox here and Marianne will collect it from the mailbox or you can do text to give with the number on the screen. Thank you again for your faithfulness. Let's continue with our morning offering. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for supporting the work of our church through all of these, these crazy times. Speaking of crazy times, uh, uh, we're usually in the chapel, but there's construction out there right now. You so can loud. hear it a little bit now, but you can really hear it in there. So let's gonna, we're gonna pray here in the sanctuary today. Uh, ready? Yeah, let's pray. Holy, good, and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day together. We give you thanks for new and creative ways to be the church. We give you thanks for the way this congregation continues to reach out in big ways to serve our community and in small ways to serve one another and those in need. We pray this day, O oh God, for the world. We pray that your justice would roll down like waters, that your truth would be proclaimed, that where there is hopelessness, your hope would shine clearly, that you would love the, the lonely, befriend those who feel alone, comfort the grieving, heal the sick, and help all of us to be the hands and feet of Christ wherever we are called. God, this is a difficult time for us as your people. We pray that you would give us minds of wisdom and open hearts to love others the way that you have loved us, that our lives, when people look at them, might look different from the things we see around us and give people hope for tomorrow. Be with us, God, this day. Help us to feel your spirit speaking within us. Help us to know how you call us to live. 
and unite us together as your church, your people, that we might move forward as this congregation and continue to do ministry here. We unite our voices together now, and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll go now from this time and place to, to serve others in hidden ways. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, be with those you love, and be with those who no one loves. Amen. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. And now for an amazing story. Hey guys, thanks for tuning back in. Last week we talked about how Jesus was teaching and performing miracles. People were starting to hear about Jesus and about all the amazing things that he was doing. So everywhere that he went, large crowds would follow. Well, on one particular day, the crowds began to gather to see what Jesus might have to say. So Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat up above the crowds and his disciples, they joined him and Jesus began to teach his disciples and the crowd that was gathering. And let's listen to what he said in Matthew chapter five, verse 13. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. So let's talk about that. Jesus told the people, you are the salt of the earth. Now, what does that mean? Well, I have some different kinds of salt here today. I don't know if you can really tell what they are. I've got like a large kind of rock salt. And then I've got some pink Himalayan salt here. I can't know, I don't know if you can see that that's pink or not. And then just some regular old white table salt. It comes in all different forms. Back in the day, salt was really valuable. It wasn't easy to get. In fact, sometimes Roman soldiers were even paid in salt. God wanted salt to be a part of the sacrifices that we read about in the Old Testament, which shows us that it went way beyond a simple seasoning. It was also used to preserve meat so the meat wouldn't go bad. Salt was even required to make purple dye, which was why only kings and queens ever wore purple because it was so expensive. So yes, salt was valuable. But why did Jesus say that we are like salt? Well, for one thing, that means that we are valuable. Each of us is made in God's image, but also as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to preserve things and keep them fresh and good. We're supposed to act in a way that makes the world better. We're supposed to show God's love and goodness to others with our actions. We don't want to lose our saltiness. Don't worry, folks, there's nothing wrong with your TV. You'll see it's all part of the lesson. So let's get back to what Jesus was talking about, teaching on the mountainside. And he continued on in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. He said this, You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. So Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Well, what do lights do? They shine in the darkness, right? If you're scared in the dark, you just turn on a light. If you're fumbling around in a dark room, you turn on a light. When we do good things for the people around us, it's like we are shining the light of God's love. You wouldn't turn on a light and then try to cover it up with a bowl, would you? Of course not. You'd let it shine so it could light the whole house. Jesus was saying that we shouldn't hide our light either. We should keep shining for him by showing his love everywhere that we go. 
So Jesus continued on. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He said, in the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. So what happens when we let our light shine? Well, other people will be able to see those good things that we do and they'll know that we act that way because we believe and follow God. They'll start to understand that the reason we act the way we do is because of him. When we use our creativity to help others, it's a really cool way that we can share God's story. We can share what God is doing in us on the inside by the way we treat people on the outside. There's no limit to God's creativity. The same God who made the sun and the stars and everything we can see in the universe also made you. He made you in his image and he made you for a reason, to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you and for you to know him. And he feels that way about everyone. He made everyone and he wants a relationship with everyone. Remember, God created everything. There was darkness and then God created light. Just like the stars point to a creator, your life can point others to God's story too. You can show what a difference God has made in your life by the way you act each day. You can act in a way that shines his light by sharing his love with others. And if they wonder where that kindness and that goodness comes from, you can tell them that everything good and creative in you comes from God. God created you to share his story. And we're going to talk to God about that. And we're going to pray for a second. So let's bow our heads and let's talk to God. Dear God, thank you for creating everything we can see. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for creating every person who's watching this right now. I know you created us to know you and you want the same thing for everyone in our lives. Everyone will ever meet. You want all of us to understand how much you love us. Help us to use our creativity to shine a light for you as we share your story. Help us to tell others about you with our words and with our actions. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. God made you in his image. He made you good at something. So whatever your gift or your talent is, use it well. Give it everything you've got. And that's a great way that you can honor God. See, God made us to share his story with our words and our actions in all kinds of creative ways. He wants everyone to know the amazing story of how much he loves us so much that he sent his own son, Jesus, to be our savior. It's the greatest story ever. And he created us to share it. God created you to share his story. So think about it. What does it look like for you to be salt and light? Remember, we show God's love with our actions, not just our words. And there's no limit to the ways you can share his love with others. You can use the creativity God gave you to love others and give them a glimpse of how good he is. Maybe you could invite a friend to watch Sunday school online one week, or you could uh, um, share some salt and vinegar chips and talk about today's story. Maybe you could even ask someone how you can pray for them. There are limitless ways to share God's story and shine his light. Guys, thank you so much for hanging in for the month of August and our creativity. Um, next month, we'll have all new stuff for you, so make sure that you tune in so you can learn all about it. Bye.